you for that. It's great just to be able to um, bless people. We're so grateful for so many wonderful people that really serve faithfully in the life of this church. And so bless you, everyone who serves in many, many different ways. We've got great serving hearts in this church. So bless you. But let's open the word of God. And before we do that, let's just pray. So Father, we just thank you, Lord, as we open your word today, Lord, that you'd speak to us, encourage us, Lord, and help us to grow in you, Lord. We want to grow in you to be everything that you've made us to be. So Father, help us this day as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is, uh, was not only the National Day of Thanksgiving, it's actually um, the Pentecost Sunday. And it's a very significant time in the Christian calendar. Obviously, we have Christmas, which is the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have Easter, where we celebrate the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then there's also uh, Pentecost Sunday, uh, where we really remember what happened on the day of Pentecost. Now, it's a very significant uh, time in the Jewish calendar. This is the second of their major feasts actually happened on this day, uh, on the Jewish feast of Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks, which was 50 days after the Passover. And they bought their first fruits. And later on, it also became a celebration where they would uh, remember and celebrate when the law was given through Moses as well. And for us, it's got significance because this event uh, occurs. It's, uh, it happens uh, 50 days after Easter Sunday, and it's uh, 10 days after the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is a very significant event. And why is it so significant? It's because something that was very precious, actually not something, but really someone who was very precious was promised to be given to us on this day of Pentecost. And so there's a promise gift that the Lord gave, and he was very faithful in making sure that he gave us this wonderful promise. And I want to read a little bit about from the scripture about this promise gift, about the wonderful person of the Holy Spirit. Now, John the Baptist, he first of all was speaking about the promise of the, of, of the Holy Spirit to come. And he said this in Matthew chapter 3 and in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, he's talking about Jesus, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John the Baptist, who was talking about Jesus who was coming, and he's saying that Jesus would baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And Jesus, in his own teaching, he spoke about the Holy Spirit. He said, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. And so Jesus said, talking about the Holy Spirit, he says, whom? Because we're talking about the Holy Spirit, not some mystical invisible force. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third member of the Godhead. And the scripture makes it clear that he has his own mind, his will, uh, he can distribute gifts of the Spirit, he can be grieved, he has emotions. And so there is definitely the person of the Holy Spirit. And it was promised that the Holy Spirit, he would be coming at, in and available for every believer. In Luke 24, 49, he said, And now I will send the Holy Spirit. So this is Jesus making a promise just before the ascension. He's talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised. But stay here into the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. What a wonderful promise that he was giving. He was telling the disciples, just wait here and, and wait here in Jerusalem because you're going to have this amazing promise that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to come and fill you. And in Acts 8, 1, 9, again, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples, telling them about this beautiful promise, the person of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he said to them. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that was Acts 1, 8. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so there's something about being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us to be a more effective witness for Jesus Christ, more effective as a believer in our standing for Christ, standing for his word, standing for his ways and being empowered by the Spirit within our lives. And so they were told to wait until they got clothed with power on high or filled with the Holy Spirit. Or some people talk about being baptised in the Holy Spirit. Now, when somebody becomes a believer, don't they actually already have the Holy Spirit? 
And yes, the answer to that is yes, of course, definitely. When anyone gives their heart to Christ, when they repent of their sin, they receive Jesus as their Lord and Saviour into their life. When they're born again, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in their heart. And so it's important that we understand there is a little difference what we're talking about here. When I'm talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit or clothed with power on high or baptised in the Holy Spirit, as they were told to wait for, it's different from what happens when we become a Christian, when we're born again, when we have the person of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us or Christ dwelling within us, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. It tells us in Ephesians 2.5, it says this, that he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And so when we become a Christian, something becomes alive. Now, it's not our body. We're already alive. What comes alive is our spirit becomes alive. If we don't know Jesus Christ, then we are spiritually dead. We're cut off from God and we don't have the life of his spirit within us. And our own human spirit, it's as if it's dead. It's dead in sin. And the only way to deal with that is to come into Jesus Christ and acknowledging our sin and receiving him, having our sins washed away and forgiven. And then our spirit becomes alive in Jesus Christ. And so it's important to know that because you have a body, you have a mind, but you have a spirit which becomes alive when we become a Christian. And the scripture makes it very clear that when we become born again, that we do have the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit indwelling within their life. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 1, 22, it said his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And so if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, then you have the Holy Spirit indwelling within you. You're born again, your spirit's alive, and the Holy Spirit is living with inside your heart and within your life. And that's for every believer, every born again Christian has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. Jesus spoke about this. Remember when Jesus was at the well and, and the Samaritan woman came up to him and, uh, and he said, you give me a drink. And she said, you're a Samaritan. You're talking to me. I'm a woman. And you're also a Jew. You're talking to a Samaritan. And, and yet Jesus had this conversation. And a part of this discourse, he said this in John chapter 4, 13 and 14. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. So just the water in this well. But whoever drinks the water... I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. And so when we have the Holy Spirit within our life, we have him dwelling within us. He is our strength. We can draw on the power of the Holy Spirit within us because we're born again and we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. And so he told told him about this spring that we can draw on the well, the life spring of the Holy Spirit, draw upon the life and his substance and strength within our life. And so when you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in your life. And this good little question is, is, well, when did the disciples actually get born again? When did they have the Holy Spirit indwelling within them? Because they'd walked with Jesus and they saw the miracles and they began to uh, believe in him. But when did that point of them having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, their born again experience, if you like, well, it's an interesting little verse in John chapter 22. And this is uh, Jesus' is one of his post-resurrection appearances. So he's died on the cross. He hasn't gone to the Father yet. And there's many appearances where Jesus, over a period of 40 days, he appeared uh, to people, to the disciples. And at one time, over 500 people saw Jesus alive after he'd been dead, before he went to the Father, when he had risen again. And when he was with them, in one of these occurrences, in John 20, 22, it says... And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus had died on the cross, hadn't gone to the Father yet, but he breathed on on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And so they had then had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is what we have when we become a Christian, when we give our life to Christ, we receive what he did, the sacrifice upon the cross, and we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. That deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And so every believer, if you're giving your life to Christ, you're born again, you've repented of your sin, you've received him as Lord and Saviour of your life, and that you've received that forgiveness, you've become a child of the living God, 
then you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. But see, it's one thing is to, to have that, which every believer has, but there is that other experience, what I want to talk about, that Pentecost experience or the Pentecostal experience, if you like, which is where the Holy Spirit came upon them at, like being clothed with power from on high. They were told to wait in Jerusalem for this to happen. And because there are people that are born again, they love God with all their heart, they're 100% saved, they've got the power of the Spirit, they can draw on the Lord's strength and His encouragement and His life and, and the, the even dwelling of the Spirit within them. But there are those who are like that, but they still haven't understood about that Pentecost experience, about being clothed with power. And there's a great example in Samaria. We have Peter and John that are going there, and this is what they find. And this is from Acts chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, that simply been baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus. So they find these believers that are sincere believers, they love the Lord, they're saved, they're going to heaven, uh, and they're good, godly people, good hearts. But they hadn't really heard about the Holy Spirit. They hadn't heard about being clothed with power on high, that there's this infilling or baptising in the Holy Spirit. They had the indwelling of the Spirit because it says they were believers that even been baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. But they, the Holy Spirit hadn't yet come upon them. And, and many people are like that. And maybe you're like that. Maybe you're a believer today. But you haven't actually had that experience of Pentecost. And my encouragement today is that you will actually come into that experience on this precious day, this day of Pentecost. And so we have people then that are, uh, are born again but, and love God going to heaven, but they don't, haven't received as yet this empowering on high. Now, does that make someone who has experienced that and someone hasn't, does that make them better? It doesn't make one person better than another, but I'll tell you what, it makes you better in who you are if you are clothed with power on high because you're able to move so powerfully in the things of the Spirit. Every believer can draw upon that well, but there's something more that you can do, something greater in terms of your ability to minister and touch the lives of other people. Now, we can talk, look at the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul, when he was um, on the road to Damascus, he had this incredible encounter. He encountered Christ. All those around him would just fall into the ground, like out of there unconscious. Uh, he was blinded by this light and he yielded to the Lord there. But it tells us later on he had to go into the city in, in, and uh, once he got there to Damascus, he then got filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, in John 7, now Jesus made this uh, promise about the being baptised in the Holy Spirit. He said, whoever believes in me. So this is what Jesus is saying to a believer. These are people that love him and they made the dwelling of the Spirit within him. But he says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivings, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So people that have believed in him, and, and, and these are ones who were believers, but he said that it's going to, the Holy Spirit will come and then rivers of living water. So John chapter 4 talked about when we're born again, we've got this well of salvation that we can draw on the strength of the Holy Spirit in our life for every believer. But then this subsequent experience that we're talking about today is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and then the rivers of living water will flow from your life to overflow and touch other people to help you and to help me to be that better witness that we can stand for Jesus Christ and begin to proclaim and show not only by our words, but our life, the things of God bursting forth out of our life. So all of these things lead us to this day of Pentecost, this day when all of them gathered together and they'd been for 10 days, uh, Jesus had made appearances and, um, and then Jesus had ascended to heaven. And so, so after 10 days after the ascension, these believers are coming together and they're still a little bit unsure, still a little bit confused about what's going on. And, and, but they're praying together, they're seeking the Lord together. And this is what happens to them as they gather and as they pray. And when the day of Pentecost come, came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
And they seemed, saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They began to speak in tongues. This is the Holy Spirit came upon them where they were sitting. And this is, it was like the sound of a rushing wind. It wasn't a rushing wind. This was like a roaring, maybe like a jet engine, this loud noise that they could hear. And then the Holy Spirit coming down, it looked like little flames of fire, like little tongue size or tongue shape coming down on each of their heads. And this incredible thing that begins to happen is that then they begin to pray in, this, in these other languages and then they begin to pray in tongues. And now it tells us as we read the rest of that passage that, that other people there are thinking, hey, what's going on? These guys are all, must be drunk or something. And other people come, but and these are all people from our local people here, but they're speaking in the language of the Parthians and the Medes and all these different languages. And, and people are wondering what on earth is going on. Because there's something dynamic happening here. Is, is there's people who were already believers, who already had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit comes upon them on the day of Pentecost. As was promised, as Jesus said, wait until you get clothed with power on high. And so there's this subsequent experience where they are clothed with power. And uh, that's a wonderful encouragement to all of us. I, I pray and trust that you'll be crying out to receive all that God has for you. And it's to be born again and to be baptised in water. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ to be baptised. But then there's this other experience where this supernatural endowment of power upon our lives to make us more effective for ministry, for life and to be His witness. Above all, to be His witness. But there's this amazing other thing that happens when we are filled with the Spirit of God is the ability to speak in, this, in tongues in this supernatural prayer language. Now, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, a little bit about speaking in tongues and well, what's it about and why, why do we need to speak in tongues? And remember, it's got nothing to do with salvation. The cross alone, coming to Christ, is the sole thing to do with salvation. Tongues has got nothing to do with salvation. But I'll tell you, well, what is the purpose of tongues? Before we do that, let's just take a moment to have a look at this little clip about some research that was done to people when they were speaking in tongues, when they put neurological scans upon them. Very interesting. So let's just watch this little clip. Today, we examine the Christian practice of speaking in tongues. Those outside the church often say it's nothing more than gibberish. But some Christians claim that it's the purest form of prayer beyond the constraints of normal language. Nightline's Vicki Mabry reports on the science of speaking in tongues. Not personally experience it or have been taught against it all their lives. There's no way they have an ability to embrace it. So that's common. We're still mocked and made fun of. And yellows and red here. At the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Andrew Newberg is looking for an explanation for what most regard as unexplainable. I mean, it's not language. It's not regular language, at least, that would normally activate the frontal lobe. Newberg is exploring the relationship between faith and science, studying what happens in the brain during the deepest moments of faith. If we're really going to look at this very, very powerful force in human history of religion and spirituality, I think we really have to take a look at how that affects our brain, what's changing or turning on or turning off in our brain. He discovered that what's happening to them neurologically looks a lot like what they say is happening to them spiritually. This is the first scan when he was in prayer, speaking in English. This is the second scan when he is praying in tongues. Pastor Stoltzfus's scan showed that his frontal lobe, the part of the brain that controls language, was active when he prayed in English, but for the most part it fell quiet when he prayed in tongues. When they're actually engaged in this whole a very intense spiritual practice, religious practice for them, their frontal lobes tend to go down in activity, but I think it's very consistent with the kind of experience that they have because they say that they're not in charge. They're, it's the voice of God, it's the Spirit of God that's moving through them. In earlier studies, Dr. Newberg looked at what happens in the brains of Buddhist monks meditating and Franciscan nuns praying. The people who are like the Buddhists and the Franciscan nuns who are in prayer because they are very intensely focused and in those individuals the frontal lobes actually increased activity. 
Okay, so that's quite interesting what they were doing. Uh, some scientific analysis of people speaking in tongues. So look, for, for people who, who don't know uh, the things of God or, or for, for, for people that maybe even heard, some of this stuff can be a little bit weird, can be a little bit scary and a little bit weird. Well, you, well, well it is because it's a supernatural thing, but it's very powerful and it's something for every single believer to get a hold on. Now, what about this tongues thing that when the day of Pentecost, they're all speaking in tongues and these languages. Well, what is that? And, and, and I just want to encourage us that that wasn't just for them. That is actually for us for now. It's a very powerful and effective tool, an effective way that we can pray in our lives by being able to pray in tongues. Now, remember, the purpose of being baptised in the Holy Spirit is not so you can speak in tongues. It's so that you can be an effective witness for Christ. You're a powerful witness. But along with that comes this wonderful prayer language that we are endowed with, which helps us to pray. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a little while. But what about this tongues thing? And there are some, there are some people that say, well, that was fine. And that when the apostles all finished and all of the end of the apostolic age, that was the end of that. And they base that on, on 1 uh, Corinthians 13. It's about tongues will cease. It says prophecies will cease, tongues will cease. And it says knowledge will cease. Well, we know when those things will cease, when Jesus Christ comes back. We won't need any of those things. But, but no one can say, oh, well, there's no longer any tongues because that ceased. No, well, then, then that means knowledge has ceased too. So why are we studying the Word of God? Why are we reading, trying to grow in God? No, no, all of these things are still there. They're still all available to us. And so Jesus, he actually prophesied that you as a believer, me as a believer, that believers would speak in tongues. In John 16, 17, he said that we would speak in other tongues. The Bible records that Paul spoke in tongues. In fact, Paul says, I praise God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. Well, why did he do that? We'll find out a little bit later, but certainly Paul did do that. And again, and as I mentioned before, that these tongues was an important part of, of, of people being recognised as having been filled with this subsequent experience. It was a way that people could actually help see well, that these people uh, had been filled with the Spirit because we'll find that in Scripture that when people were filled with the Spirit, the, the normal experience for people is that they would then have this prayer language. In, in Acts 19, um, verses 1 to 2 and verse 6, it says this, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, obviously, they had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Paul's asking, have you been clothed with power on high? And they answered, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So when Paul placed his hand on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. And you find that that's the reoccurring theme of Scripture. When people are filled with the Holy Spirit, endowed with power on high, this subsequent experience, this Pentecostal experience, that then they're able to pray in tongues. They speak, able to speak in tongues. And so that was in Ephesus. And then we find that even with, uh, with amongst the Gentiles, when Peter was with the centurion Cornelius, and we read all about that in Acts 10, verses 44 to 48, and this is what it says. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came upon all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who came with Peter were astonished, astonished <clears throat> that the gift of the Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And so that's, for them, that's how they concluded that. Think, hang on, well, these guys, they're obviously Christians. They're obviously born again. And, and we can't even stop them being baptised because we, they've actually been filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's come upon them. How do we know that? Is because these Gentiles are speaking in tongues, not just the apostles, not just the disciples. These Gentiles who've just given their life and understood the things of God, had a revelation of that listening to Peter preach. If their hearts have been filled and full of the Spirit of God, then they've been filled with the Spirit and begin speaking in tongues. And so that's a sign of that, that that has occurred, that people that normally who have been filled with the Holy Spirit in that way are able to speak in tongues. And again, so that happened in Scripture. And uh, as I mentioned in Acts 8, 17 and 18 before, I mentioned about uh, Peter and John in Samaria. It says, And Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. 
These are the ones who believers but hadn't been filled with the Spirit. And when Simon saw that the Spirit, this is Simon the sorcerer, not Simon Peter. When Simon saw the Spirit was given on the laying of on the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And that's again in Acts 8, 17 and 18. Now, what did he see? What, what, there was something obviously physical, visible that Simon saw for him to think, wow, well, these guys have got the Holy Spirit too. Now, it doesn't specifically, explicitly say, well, they were speaking in tongues, but consistent with what other parts of Scripture is that was the sign that these ones had been actually filled with the Holy Spirit as well as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Now, what, what about these tongues? Now, what, what, what am I speaking when I speak in tongues? Well, it tells us in the scripture, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels. So when someone is praying in this supernatural tongue or praying in tongues, it could be a language that they've never learnt themselves, an existing human language, or maybe a, one that's not even around anymore. There's a few archaic languages in, in, in human history. Or it could be an angelic tongue. And so when somebody is speaking in tongues, the origin of that tongue could be a, it's a, a human tongue they've never learnt, or it can be uh, an angelic tongue. And so that's the nature of the tongue. Well, what actually is actually going on when somebody is speaking in tongues? Well, first of all, when someone is speaking in tongues, their heart is, is engaged in loving God. And, and I don't know whether you've, if, if you speak another language, I don't, but for people who speak different languages, they, they can express themselves very well in one language. But when they try to express some things in maybe their second language, it's a little bit harder. They know the word in French or they know the word in German or what other language, but then they try to put that in English. Uh, they just struggle to find the expression for that and the words just seem so inadequate. Well, sometimes I tell you what, when we are praying, uh, we just want to express something that's in our heart, something in our spirit, but we can find it a little bit hard, find it inadequate to express the words. But that's one of the things about the power of being able to pray in tongues. What actually is happening when I'm praying in tongues? Well, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 and 15, it says this. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I'll also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I'll also sing with my understanding. So when I'm praying with God, uh, praying in tongues, I'm actually my human spirit. Remember, I'm body, mind and spirit. And so I'm, when I'm praying in tongues, yes, I'm, my mind is towards the Lord, but I don't, don't know really what I'm saying. But my spirit is expressing things unto God. It's expressing mysteries unto God, it tells us in the scripture, that, 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 that we're expressing something from our spirit when we do that. Now, our spirit's been made alive by the Holy Spirit, made alive because of Christ. And so the Holy Spirit and our own human, recreated human spirit all entwined together. But so we're able to pray and with our spirit, very powerful way to pray. So we pray with our understanding. So we still pray in our own native language, in our own thinking language, that we're thinking thoughts and expressing our prayers and petitions and requests unto God as the scripture encourages us to do. But we also have this prayer language. So when I'm speaking in tongues, it can be the tongues of men, tongues, and an, or even an angelic tongue, but it's the voice of my spirit, my spirit expressing uh, my love for God, my heart for God, or even deep yearnings of intercessions in prayer, and prayer, and very, very powerful. And that really touches on the whole purpose of speaking in tongues. Why, why, why do we want to speak in tongues? What's the point? You know, what's the benefit in speaking in tongues? Well, as I mentioned before, there's, there's a, a level of wanting to express something that you just can't with your own human mind and intellect express, but when you're praying in tongues, you're able to express something. It's very powerful being able to pray in tongues. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 4, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. Now the word there, edify, means to build up or as like erecting stones, putting them one on top of another, building something. And I tell you what, a lot of people spend a lot of money on gyms these days. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. And uh, people are all looking forward to getting into gyms and doing all this exercise and stuff. And it's good. Paul says, you know, it's of some value. Physical training is of some value. Godliness is of obviously greater value, but it is of value. People spend a lot of money building up their bodies. 
And they spent a lot of money building up their minds, education. Education is a billion dollar business and uh, people educate themselves and it's important that we do as best that we can, educate and learn as much as we can. We can build up our mind. But what about our spirit? And see, one of the things to make yourself strong in the spirit is by praying in tongues. It, is, it, it edifies us, it builds us up and it's very, very important to do that. Now, just one thing about that when I'm talking about praying in tongues, don't get mixed up with the, the gift of, of, of tongues. When the scripture talks about um, prophecy and the Holy Spirit giving out gifts. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit that have been given out there, it talks about healings and miracles and uh, um, gifts of faith. And amongst that, it talks about tongues and, uh, and saying the Holy Spirit gives according to his will. Now, don't get confused with that. Some people say, oh, well, some people get that gift, I've got another gift. Well, no, they're the gifts that are given collectively for the building up of the body of Christ. And if, you, if there's a message in tongues and then there's an interpretation, those things together equal prophecy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your own personal prayer language. We are able to pray in tongues, pray in the Spirit, uh, and to articulate what is really going on within your heart to God. Because can I tell you, there are times when you don't know how to pray. And I think you probably would have felt that. I know there's been times where I just don't know how to pray. One, because I don't really understand what's going on. I don't even know how I'm feeling, why I'm feeling. Or there's a circumstance and, and, and I just don't even really know what is the right answer for that. And, and, and I want to pray and I want to pray effectively, but I just don't, I don't know how to pray. And I'm sure you've had times where you just don't really know how to pray for someone or something or some situation or even for yourself. And you're just not sure how to pray. Well, that's the beauty of being able to pray in tongues with this beautiful heavenly prayer language, which is that hotline between you and the Father in heaven as you praying in the Spirit. Very, very powerful way to pray. And, 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 and yeah, I'll, I'll pray with my mind and my understanding, but, but I don't always understand it. And my mind doesn't really always grasp anything, but I still want to be able to pray effectively. And praying in tongues is very helpful with that. Romans 8, 26 to 28, it says this, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes through for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And, and I want to pray with the perfect will of God. And, and so the Holy Spirit, he knows my heart, he knows my needs, knows that, but he knows the perfect will of the Father. And he can help me pray that's in accordance with the perfect will of the Father. Very powerful way to pray. But Paul says, I pray with my mind but I'll also pray in the Spirit. And so we pray both ways. You know, just one doesn't replace the other. No, I'm going to ignore the things of the Spirit. I'm just going to pray with my mind and my own understanding. No, 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 we do both of those things. But tell you what, it is a very, very powerful way to pray. And so I really want to encourage you on this day of Pentecost about that second experience. Yes, you're born again and we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. We can draw on the well of living water. We can draw on that for our sustenance and for our strength and for our life. We can draw on that because we're, we're believers, we're born again. But they were told to wait until this subsequent experience when they were going to be clothed in power and high, filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and can I encourage you to, to, to look for that, to seek for that, that you might have that, that you might be a more effective witness in your life. Doesn't mean you're a better person than someone else. It means you're just a better you. You can be more effective within yourself um, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit in that way. And then you have that wonderful benefit of being able to pray in this supernatural prayer language, to be able to pray in tongues and to build yourself up and to be able to pray when you don't even really know how to pray, to do that in an effective way. And so it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. So how do I get this? How do I receive uh, the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, you've got to be born again. You need to be born again. You need to give your life to Jesus Christ. You give your life to Christ. You repent of all your sin. You invite Jesus into your life. You say, Lord, I give you an exchange, all the sin and junk of my life. Lord, I take your righteousness and your forgiveness at the work of the cross, what you did on the cross. 
to wipe away my sin and to, to, to give me forgiveness. Lord, I receive that. I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. And I receive your holiness that I might become a child of God who stands with the promise of eternal life. And so there's that wonderful exchange being born again. So you've got to be born again. And when you're born again from that moment, your spirit becomes alive and the Holy Spirit is indwelling within your heart. But then there's this other experience where we can pray like that Pentecost, the day of Pentecost and praying together and with one heart or praying with your mind directed towards Christ. So you can do that just loving Jesus with all that you are and just loving him. And just with the own words that just seem to be inadequate, you can begin to speak out those words and the little syllable will form on the tongue and you begin to speak forth those words. And as you begin to speak forth those words, it develops into language and you're able then to articulate what is going on in your heart. The same as like a little baby, when a baby starts to talk, a little baby goes, mama, dada, mama, dada, mama. Uh, and when someone is learning to the things of the Spirit, when they first get filled with the Spirit, it's, it takes a little steps of faith, those little words or syllables, and then it begins to flow into language. Very powerful way to pray. So how do I do that? Well, I've got to ask. It says in Luke 11 to 13, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And so I would simply pray, say, Lord, let me be filled with your spirit. Lord, I want to be endowed with power on high because I want to be the better witness. Lord, I want to be a better witness for myself. Lord, I want to be everything you want me to be, Lord, or made me to be. I want to grow in that, Lord. And so ask for that. Ask him to fill you. Then begin to pray with all your heart. But just out of their own words, just seem to be inadequate. Your own normal first language doesn't seem to express what's in your spirit. Then you take a leap of faith. And then as you begin to speak forth a little syllable and then as one begins after another, it's like a dam bursts. And then you're able to pray in this wonderful, beautiful, supernatural language, uh, which is such a wonderful, powerful to pray way to pray. So I encourage you today, just receive what is promised. God, God is very faithful. He promised the Holy Spirit. And, and he said to wait, wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Tarry in Jerusalem until you get filled with the Holy Spirit. And my encouragement to you today is that you will be one and say, yes, I love Jesus with all my heart, but I want to enter into this Pentecostal experience, what they did happen to them on the day of Pentecost. I want it to happen for me that I can be powerful as a witness, but also this wonderful prayer language, which is just a wonderful blessing for each and every one. So I want to pray for you right now and pray for all of us now. If you're a believer, you've been filled with the Spirit uh, as well and, you, and, and you've got that supernatural prayer language, don't neglect to do that. Pray in tongues, as Paul said. I speak in tongues more than any of you because he wanted to be strong in the Spirit, build himself up. So spend time praying in tongues. But I just want to pray for all of us now. Lord, I just thank you, Father. First of all, Lord, if there's anybody who's been watching this, Lord, I think, wow, this is quite interesting. I haven't heard this before. But Lord, if they haven't found Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray, Lord, this will be the day they say, Lord, I, well, I want that. I, I want what Jesus did on the cross to count for me. Uh, and, and help them, Lord, to ask for forgiveness, Lord, and to receive you, Lord, that they might become a child of the living God. And Father, for those believers that are 100% saved, for loving you and serving you, Lord, and learning of you, Lord, and have a heart for you, Lord, I just thank you for them. But Lord, if they haven't uh, understood this experience, Lord, I pray, Lord, that this day, Lord, that they will take that step and say, yes, Lord, I want to be filled in that way. I want to be clothed with power on the high. I want to be baptised or filled, immersed with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that I can be that effective witness, Lord. And then, yes, that wonderful benefit of being able to pray in that prayer language, Lord. I pray this day, Lord, as they open their hearts in that way, Lord, they can be wonderfully and beautifully filled in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray, Lord, for those of us who, Lord, pray in tongues, Lord, but Lord, let us not neglect that, Lord. Let us pray in tongues, Lord, and keep building ourselves up, uh, Lord, because there's a world out there that need to know you, Lord, and we want to be as effective witness as we possibly can to see people come to know Jesus Christ. Bless you.